Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Wild Shape is cool. It also scales notoriously badly, even if you're a moon druid, but that doesn't mean we necessarily need to throw it out as a possible character concept. But it does mean that if we want to make a viable, optimized character, that there's more to making this kind of character beyond just choosing the best available forms at each level, though that is a good place to start. And if you're looking for guidance on that, click the link up above to my last Wild Shape video where I talk about which forms offer the most at various levels of play. Now, I want to start going over the other ways we can enhance these Wild Shape forms to make a Moon Druid that uses Wild Shape a viable, optimized character. And we're starting out with our racial selection. This one is juicy. A couple of videos ago, I talked about the difficulty in even knowing which racial features still apply when you're Wild Shaped. The rules say that you retain any benefit from your race, and you can use them if the new form is physically capable of doing so. For some racial features, this clearly indicates whether or not they can be used in Wild Shape. But for many, many more, it doesn't. The only guidance I could find from Jeremy Crawford was this tweet from five years ago that says, technically, any racial feature that doesn't specify anatomy should technically work, but it's the DM's call. Just to be clear, I'm not showing you this tweet suggesting you use it as a cudgel to pressure your DM into allowing racial features to work with Wild Shape if it doesn't fit with their personal opinions on how Wild Shape should interact with racial features. In this video, I'm going to be going over some racial options that fit within these guidelines, but are also pretty weird. My suggestion to you is if you want to choose any of these races I present today, where it's not obvious the racial feature should work with Wild Shape, that you make sure that you and your DM have a shared understanding on how the rule regarding maintaining the benefit of racial features ought to work. And if that shared understanding precludes any of the options presented here, then disregard those suggestions. Sometimes it's safe to assume that you and your DM will have a shared understanding of how a rule is supposed to work without a conversation. The interaction of racial features in Wild Shape is not one of those rules. All of my presentations here are going to fit with the guidance that Jeremy Crawford provided. So if you and your DM agree that's how Wild Shape should work, then everything I present here should be a valid option for you. So to fit with the guidelines of the tweet, I considered that any racial feature that provided spell casting would not be available while Wild Shaped, and that any feature that specified anatomy wouldn't be available either. This still leaves lots and lots of interesting options. So I actually have quite a few racial suggestions, but the benefits they provide are all quite different. So this should allow you to customize your optimized build in the way that best meets your concept and personal taste while still being mechanically optimal. I have 12 suggestions total, and half of them I think I'm at least reasonably confident that your DM should be okay with. Then we'll talk about three more where I think it's a bit more iffy, and then three more that are downright weird, but maybe also the most interesting. So here we go. The Hobgoblin. The Hobgoblin offers multiple features that should work just fine in Wild Shape. First, Fey Ancestry is giving you advantage on charm saving throws. Second, Fey Gift provides a bonus action help action that gives an additional benefit when you choose to use it. This is usable a number of times with a proficiency bonus per long rest, but bonus action options often work well with Wild Shape because many of the Wild Shape options don't have bonus actions. The big one, though, is Fortune of the Many. This gives you an after-the-fact method to improve your concentration saving throw by up to plus 3, and most of the time, it'll be plus 3. With a Wild Shape character, you are going to want to precast concentration spells before Wild Shaping. But then the challenge is maintaining your concentration, because you can't recast unless you drop your Wild Shape, at least until 18th level in Druid. Races that provide features that help you maintain concentration got high priority when I put together this list. The Shatter Kai. The Shatter Kai is one of the best racial options in Monsters of the Multiverse, and their racial features are all pretty seamless with Wild Shape. Blessing of the Raven Queen is probably the best racial bonus action teleport option, period. Usable multiple times, it also gives you resistance to all damage until the start of your next turn whenever you use it. For Moon Druid, this is great, because resistance helps to cover the weakness of a lower armor class, and if you're taking more than 20 points of damage at a time, it will help you protect your concentration as well. When Wild Shaped, you're giving up on all spells that provide teleportation, so having a non-spell teleport option is quite good. And this would carry over to all the other bonus action teleport races that I'm not covering in this video, but Shadow Kai is the standout of those options. 
In addition, you have Fey Ancestry, which should work, giving advantage on charm saving throws. Keen Senses carries over. Necrotic Resistance carries over. And even at higher levels, once we have Wild Shape duration over four hours, Trance technically should work as well. The Goblin. So, again, Fey Ancestry for that charm saving throw advantage. And with Goblin, Fury of the Small should probably work in Wild Shape, though it's not great with Wild Shape anyways, since there's a requirement that the target is larger than you. And when you're Wild Shaped, you're probably going to be large-sized or even huge-sized. This one all comes down to Nimble Escape. That should work while well Wild Shaped. So consider these things. In our Wild Shaped form, we potentially have a high movement speed. We make melee attacks. We have a lower armor class with no bonus action options. An unlimited use bonus action disengage option is just perfectly in line with all those things. Move in, multi-attack, bonus action disengage, move out. The Kobold. The primary feature of the Kobold is Draconic Cry, and it should likely work while we're wild shaped. Draconic Cry gives you a bonus action, and bonus action racial features coming up over and over, that's no coincidence. In this case, our bonus action provides advantage to attack rolls against the target within 10 feet until the start of our next turn, with the standard proficiency bonus uses. So first off, if we have big attacks or lots of attacks, this of course is a great benefit to us personally. Secondly, as a druid, it's very possible we're concentrating on a summoning spell, and there will be multiple additional attacks given advantage through that. And that's before considering the rest of your party that also makes attacks. The 10 foot range limit isn't a big limitation here, since our wild shape form is likely going to need us to get into melee anyways. Then there's Kobold Legacy, and that's the minor one. Draconic Sorcery is no help, so I would look at either Craftiness or Defiance. The Orc! Adrenaline Rush gives a bonus action dash action. It's limited in use, but it provides a modest amount of temporary hit points when you use it as well. Powerful Build probably works while Wild Shape, and means that you're determining amounts you can lift drag, push, or carry as if you were one size larger. And in wild shape, that means we're generally going to be assuming huge or gargantuan size for determining these things. Relentless endurance is a big one. If we drop to zero hit points in wild shape, not only do we lose our wild shape, but the additional damage carries over to our base hit points. Relentless endurance is especially good if you are playing a wild shape character for that reason. So imagine you're in Wild Shape and you have 10 hit points left and then you just take a massive critical hit doing like 50 points of damage. If you weren't Wild Shaped and you had 10 hit points left, then Relentless Endurance would prevent one point of damage from occurring. An important hit point, but still preventing one hit point of damage. And that's because you weren't taking more than 10 damage regardless. But while Wild Shaped, if you had 10 hit points left in your Wild Shape form, you're preventing 41 points of damage because all that additional damage would have carried over other than having Relentless Endurance, which makes this feature especially good when you're using it with Wild Shape. Okay, so now for the one I consider the best of the racial options that I think should all be okay with your DM, the Gem Dragonborn. So your source book here is Fizzman's Treasury of Dragons, which presents some nice Dragonborn variants, but we're specifically looking at the Gem Dragonborn. Though which gem ancestry you choose doesn't really matter. We're not selecting this for the breath weapon specifically, so if your DM isn't on board with you using your breath weapon while wild shaped, that's not a deal breaker. Assuming you can use your breath weapon, it says that when you take the attack action on your turn, you can replace one of your attacks with your breath weapon. So that should apply to multi-attack just the same as it does to extra attack, making those forms with more attacks more attractive. You get a damage resistance, which should apply as well. The resistance type depends on the ancestry you choose, so it's going to be Force, Radiant, Psychic, Thunder, or Necrotic. But here are the two features that really stand out as far as I'm concerned. First is Psionic Mind. Your ability to speak is limited to those your wild shape form is capable of, which means normally you won't be able to speak at all. Getting an action-free, unlimited-use telepathy I consider a huge benefit if you're using wild shape. There's a mechanical benefit, of course, but just think about the role playing. If your character is wild shaped all the time, then you can't even participate in in character conversations. But telepathy gives you an effective workaround. Second is gem flight. Winged races are out if you want flight, but gem flight grows spectral wings using your bonus action for a one minute fly speed equal to your walking speed with hover. 
many of your best wild shape options and all of your best wild shape options before level 10 can't fly. Getting concentration free flight for these forms, even if it's limited in use, is exceptional. Exceptional enough that I'm also going to give an honorable mention to the Azimar right now that should be able to get flight while wild shaped, though I figure the Gem Dragonborn offers more overall with wild shape, which is why I'm covering the Gem Dragonborn instead. So if you want to race, you can be fairly confident your DM will agree that their main racial benefits carry over while you're wild shaped, then this video is effectively over for you. Those are my recommendations. I'll give an honorable mention to Variant Human and Custom Lineage if you want that bonus feat, but I almost feel those options being good options for any build kind of goes without saying. Now let's talk about some options that should probably work, but I think ensuring you and your DM are on the same page is a bit more imperative. The Bugbear. Okay, so I think it's common knowledge at this point that the Bugbear, since Monsters of the Multiverse, is one of the most powerful races, arguably the most powerful. So let's see how their features interact with Wild Shape. Fey Ancestry should be fine, so advantage on charm saving throws. Long Limbed is a bit more iffy. Now before you comment that a limb is part of your anatomy, so there's the anatomy specified right there in the feature name, I will refer you to the tweet again where Jeremy Crawford says that fleet of foot doesn't specify anatomy. So clearly he's talking about the feature description. Five feet of additional reach is a nice add-on for wild shapes that are in general, making melee attacks with five foot range. Powerful build we covered with the orc, and if long-limbed is okay, I bet you powerful build is okay too. Surprise attack, of course, is the one that everyone talks about. 2d6 additional damage with all your attacks when you win initiative. Now winning initiative on its own is going to be a challenge. But one nice factor is we have a number of forms that are making three or more attacks, which means we get more from this feature. So Deinonychus plus surprise attack could be an additional 8d6 damage on round one. Now here's the one that I think is most iffy. Sneaky. Proficiency in the stealth skill, of course, is fine. But in addition, we can move through and stop in a space large enough for a small creature. As this is written, it means that even if we're large-sized, huge-sized, or even gargantuan-sized, which is a possibility for a moon druid, we can move through and stop in a space large enough for a small creature. That's ridiculous, of course. And this is an issue I have already talked about when Monsters of the Multiverse was first released. This feature really should say that you can move through and stop in a space large enough for a creature one size smaller than you. But even if you and your DM agree that's how it should work, and I really think that's the sensible conclusion, then this is still good because the size of your wild shape forms can be an issue when you're dealing with tight quarters. Having your large-sized wild-shaped druid being able to move through and stop in spaces large enough for a medium creature is still really a good feature for us. Probably better for us than a non-wild-shaping bugbear. The Herringon. Most of the Herringon features should be just fine. Hair trigger is the big one, the initiative boost. Some wild-shaped forms do not have good dexterity modifiers, so bonuses to initiative are welcome. The bonus proficiency should be no issue. Lucky footwork also should be just fine. Rabbit hop is the one that you're going to need in agreement with your DM. No anatomy is mentioned in the feature, so it does fit within the guidelines that we were given. So rabbit hop plus wild shape will occasionally give really silly results, but mechanically useful results as well. Rabbit hops don't provoke opportunity attacks, they use bonus actions, and they can be in any direction, including straight up. I guarantee that flying enemy is not expecting the mammoth to jump 30 feet into the air to attack. The Dampier. So our source book here is Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. So right off the bat, make sure this source book is available. The Dampier is presented as one of the lineages available, and it easily got the most attention at the time, though I haven't seen a lot of talk about it since. But it's about to get some more attention right now. Deathless Nature means you don't need to breathe. That should be fine. Spider Climb means you have a climbing speed equal to your walking speed, and you can move across vertical surfaces or even upside down. That should be fine and is excellent. The bit about your hands being free really only applies if you have hands, but in most cases that shouldn't make a difference. And Vampiric Bite is really interesting. So Vampiric Bite gives us a natural weapon that we're proficient in that makes attacks using constitution. There are multiple forms I discussed in my last video that have a plus five constitution modifier. If you're missing more than half your hit points, you get advantage with these attacks. 
And when you're wild shaped, that half hit point or less marker is far less risky. Then a number of times when you hit with the attack, you can regain hit points or gain a bonus to the next ability check or attack roll you make. Now, Vampiric Bite won't benefit from multi-attack. So it's more for multi-class druids who pick up extra attack from some other source. The biggest issue though with Vampiric Bite has always been that the attack is not considered magical for the purposes of bypassing resistance or immunity to piercing damage. There's only a couple ways in the game you can get past that. Here's one of them, Primal Strike. Starting at 6th level, your attacks and beasts form count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage. Notice it says beast form, not elemental form or wild shape form, which means as written, it should only apply to non-elemental wild shapes. Though I double checked if the designers commented on this and Jeremy Crawford says it is intended to work with elemental wild shape. Now whenever he says the words intended to work, that means he's telling you how it is supposed to work not necessarily how it's written. So this is something you and your DM need a shared agreement on how this rule works at your table. Now working a build around this bite is still not easy, though I did kind of think a dip in War Cleric could give you a bonus action bite, which might be beneficial. But you know what? The Spider Climb alone is maybe worth giving this option your consideration. Okay, so I don't think any of those options are egregious, but having a shared understanding with your DM is still important. Now, let's bend the envelope a bit with my final three racial selections. These ones are downright weird. The Autonome. So our source book here is Spelljammer, so make sure that source book is okay. But that might be the tip of the iceberg for this one. Armored Casing. I don't know. Maybe though. 13 plus Dexterity Armor Class would mean the Giant Hyena would have a 15 Armor Class instead of 12. Same for the Giant Constrictor Snake, the Air Elemental would have 18 instead of 15. If allowed, this is a nice benefit for Wild Shape. Note that if you are playing a Wild Shape creature that uses natural armor, then you're just applying the 13 plus your Dexterity modifier, not the Armor Class plus 3. If any of the features for Auto Gnome should work, Built for Success should be fine. Giving us a D4 bonus after the fact on our Concentration Saving Throws, it's limited use, but very nice. Healing Machine means that we can expand hit dice to heal after being targeted with a mending spell. Not our own hit dice, mind you. The hit dice of the creature we're transformed into, plus their constitution modifier on every roll. Elementals have 12 D10 hit dice. That's 138 points of average healing potential on an earth elemental without expending a spell slot. Mechanical Nature provides poison resistance, disease immunity, and advantage on paralyzation or poisoning saving throws. Should be pretty obvious why I think this one is weird. Interesting though, and if it's kosher with your DM, I think it's mechanically powerful. But now we're going to get into two options I think are super weird. The Changeling. So this is all about Shape Changer. I think that's all we're going to talk about here. As an action, you can change your appearance and your voice. You determine the specifics of the changes, including your coloration, hair length, and sex. You also adjust your height and weight and can change your size between medium and small. You can make yourself appear as a member of another race, though none of your game statistics change. None of your game statistics change. You can't duplicate the appearance of an individual you've never seen, and you must adopt the form that has the same basic arrangements of limbs you have. Again, you must adopt a form that has the same basic arrangement of limbs you have. This one is also important. Your clothing and equipment aren't changed by this trait. You stay in the new form until you use an action to revert to your true form or until you die. So first off, this feature doesn't specify anatomy. Secondly, this feature does not say anywhere that you need to take the form of a humanoid. Pause the video, read it through, you'll agree, it doesn't say that. So let's say you're in your bear form. Our basic arrangement of limbs, four legs. That means you could take the form of any creature of small or medium size that has the same basic arrangement of limbs, like maybe a small sized dog, for example. But your game statistics are unchanged. Even in mammoth form, we could be that small dog. If we're an earth elemental, well, here's the official artwork for the Earth Elemental, and I see two arms, and I see two legs. One might even question if your ability to change your voice would allow you to speak when you normally couldn't. I don't know about that one. Then again, I don't know about any of this. 
But this one is super weird. Really gets you thinking, though, doesn't it? Okay, and we're finishing up our list with maybe the weirdest and I think potentially coolest option. The plasmoid. The source book here is Spelljammer, so again, make sure that's okay. Oh, and you'll need to buy your DM a pizza if they give the thumbs up here. But I'd pay for that pizza gladly, because this would be a riot to play. I noticed this one right away in that video where I talked about racial features in Wild Shape, but I've been keeping this one under my hat. There's two features we need to look at here. So the first one, Shape Self, says, as an action, you can reshape your body to give yourself a head, one or two arms, one or two legs, and makeshift hands and feet. And while in a human-like shape, you can wear clothing and armor made for a humanoid of your size. As a bonus action, you can extrude a pseudopod that is up to six inches wide, and that's not really what I'm focused on here. Now, it would be reasonable for your DM to say that this feature does refer to anatomy, but you might also agree that it refers to anatomy that you're creating, not anatomy you already have. This one is crazy. It technically means you could use weapons, wear armor, while wild-shaped. But that one's not the most crazy. Amorphous absolutely does not refer to anatomy. When Spelljammer came out, I reviewed the plasmoid, and I showed just how crazy good this feature could be. And rather than repeat myself, I'll just link that video up above. You can squeeze through a space as narrow as one inch wide, provided you are wearing and carrying nothing. And grapple checks, blah, blah, blah. Here's what my viewers told me in the comments. Sure, that sounds great, but what player character isn't carrying or wearing anything? Here's your answer. Sorry it took a while. My druid, wild shaped into a bear or wild shaped into anything else for that matter, is not wearing or carrying anything. I mean, unless I use shape self, but that's another matter. Between shape self and amorphous, the plasmoid is super weird if these features are allowed with wild shape. But, like I said at the beginning of the video, I am presenting the legal options using Jeremy Crawford's guidance. If you and your DM think an oozy-shaped, wild-shaped druid sounds cool and fun, then I agree with you. And this really opens up some very interesting possibilities. There's my list. I've given some safe options I think are really good. The gem Dragonborn, I think, is just a lovely option and should be just fine. I've given some iffy options, and I've given some downright weird options which, if allowed, offer some really off-the-wall options that could still be really, really fun for you, the other players, and the DM. If there are other racial features that you think work especially well with Wild Shape, please share them in the comments. Otherwise, until the next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon.